Over the last year, we have all seen a uh, resurgent Black Lives Matter movement spurring reflection about racial injustice in institutions around the world. And of course, it includes the news media. And many newsrooms have uh, tried to introduce measures to improve diversity and inclusion, but others feel we need to go further and to re-examine how stories are told, which stories are told, by whom, for whom. The New Humanitarian is one such organization, and we are going on a journey internally to figure out how we can challenge the power structures within journalism, and this conversation is a part of that effort. So welcome to this joint session between the New Humanitarian and the Elephant on Journalism 3.0, Decolonizing the Media. Um, as you just heard, I'm uh, Hiba Ali. I'm the CEO of the New Humanitarian. We are an independent nonprofit newsroom dedicated to reporting about humanitarian crises around the world, from conflicts to disasters, epidemics to refugee flows. We're headquartered um, where I am here in Geneva, but have reporters around the world who are trying to inform the world's response to crises in the hopes of improving the lives of people in need. And I think while many newsrooms fail to adequately represent the people they serve, this is a particular challenge in covering humanitarian crises in the so-called global south as we do. Um, you know, conflict and disasters and famine, these are all topics that tend to see higher rates of what we call a parachute or white savior journalism. And uh, we find ourselves often only reflecting the worst of a, a certain society's reality. So today we're gonna zero in on decolonization of media coverage of the Global South in particular. And I've invited Patrick Gathara um, to unpack this issue with me for a few reasons. Patrick is a cartoonist, a political commentator, a writer, a columnist for uh, Kenyan newspapers, as well as um, International, The Washington Post, Al Jazeera, Financial Times. Perhaps most importantly, I think he's one of the most astute voices I've heard in critiquing media coverage of the Global South. You may know of his satirical Twitter threads, and if you don't, uh, do look him up on Twitter, where he describes events that take place in the West the way they would be described if they had happened in Africa in a bid to kind of point out the hypocrisy and um, double standards that we use in our language. Um, he's the curator in chief of The Elephant, a platform for engaging African citizens to re-envision their society, and it kind of straddles the line between traditional newsroom and, and digital blog. He's done research on media ethics. Um, he's recently done his master's on um, ethical decision-making for news publishers in the digital age. Um, so we've got uh, tons to unpack together. And uh, Patrick, as you said yourself in a recent FT column, I think news organizations are um, picking their way through this ethical minefield of uh, what we're calling decolonization without having a map. And it's a huge topic that we can only, of course, begin to scratch the surface of in, in 30 minutes. Um, but if what you hear today piques your interest, the New Humanitarian will be organizing a convening later in the year to discuss this in more detail. So sign up in the link, which will drop into the chat if you want to be informed about that. Um, and I'll just say, I, I think we recognize that no one really has the answers on this. It's a, a reflection that we're trying to um, have collectively. Uh, so you might hear more questions than answers today, but at least we can give it a start. Um, and particularly as two independent newsrooms, we do perhaps have a bit more freedom to show courage, uh, leadership and experimentation on this issue. So let's dive in. Patrick, welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Um, maybe we should just start with trying to define what decolonization means in a journalistic context. Well, I think decolonization of the media is very much uh, uh, similar to decolonization in general. Um, uh, it is about unlearning systems uh, and unlearning ways of doing things that were the vogue, I suppose, um, uh, during colonial times and that were taught to many of our societies, also to many of our journalists, both in the West and uh, um, uh, in the Global South, about how to write about, how to explore, how to talk about um, uh, uh, other societies. And lots of this were essentially tropes that were introduced in a, in a way that um, uh, established the West uh, uh, and Europe as the default.
and share a few thoughts from us until we get them back. Patrick, oh, you there? Sorry, did I, did I lose you guys? Yes, you were talking about um, the West being the kind of default. Yes, so it, um, this is basically how lots of things have been, uh, have been taught to, to us, to both audiences and to um, uh, uh, media practitioners. Um, and it's not, as I said, it's not just the West, but it's also in the global South, because um, lots of these people, how we have learned that kind of how uh, journalism is done in the West is how it should be done. So um, by understanding those tropes, they're starting to unlearn them, starting to develop new ways of talking about um, uh, uh, the global South and also talking about the West. Um, for me, that is what decolonization will look like. I think we've been having a lot of conversations about this internally in our organization as well, because um, we've committed to trying to navigate what um, greater racial justice looks like in this context. And, and we started to kind of unpack uh, decolonization a few ways. So let me just share a few thoughts and then get your, your reactions. One of the areas that we've talked about is that communities we serve play a bigger role in shaping the narratives um, that we tell. And maybe we can um, talk a little bit about that. I think we've seen a lot of um, traditional international mainstream media uh, following a model where they pop into a country, they uh, report on it for a foreign audience, and then they pop out again um, without necessarily understanding the local context enough to, I would think, understand what really matters to those communities um, and, and so we're trying to think through what are ways in which we can better consult the communities that we cover in, um, in telling us what they want us to be reporting about. And I wonder uh, what you make of that kind of definition of decolonization. Well, um, I completely agree with you that the way it has um, traditionally been approached is, I mean, it's what I call kind of like a postcard approach. So pretty much you go to a place and you send a postcard back. Um, lots of this is trying to compress events that have happened in you know, longer periods that have long tails um, into a short five minute, in fact, uh, not even five, a two minute uh, a, a TV, um, a, whatever, a, a news clip. And I think in that, uh, a lot of context is, 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 is thrown out. Um, uh, lots of background, uh, lots of understanding is basically erased. Um, people are presented, and societies are, pretend, uh, are presented as only occurring and happening in that two-minute clip. You know, um, and I think part of that is what you just said: people come in and leave. You know, so you've got um, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, you've got uh, correspondents who basically um, cover, if, if it's in Africa, you know, five, six, seven, eight countries, you know, and they just jump from one crisis to another, you know, and people watching that think, oh, I'm being told about what's happening in Congo, being told about what's happening in Zimbabwe, you see, without really knowing all they're getting is a small, very tiny view of what's happening in that country, you know, um, and this jumping around, isn't really helpful. This parachute journalism we spoke about isn't really useful in helping people explain. I think, and and and, and I think that's one of the big problems is our journalism is not really about explaining societies, helping people understand what's happening in societies. Yeah. It's simply about presenting a picture. You know, it's simply about reporting this happened yesterday and then moving on and exoticizing societies and showing how different they are from us rather than understanding just the similarities that we have between uh, different sides. And it was interesting, I was speaking recently with uh, someone from AFP who led um, a six month study there around how they can um, you know, encourage and incentivize greater uh, representation, inclusion, diversity in, in their work. And, um, and he said they had spoken to a number of, of people and th what he came away with was, you know, audiences in the global south don't just want to hear about the latest death and destruction in their countries, and they don't just want the, the worst of their worlds reflected back at them. They want to hear 
also stories of development and of progress that, as you say, give a fuller picture of what it means to live in, in um, these areas and these countries. And I think that's uh, certainly a challenge for us in the humanitarian because so much of what we cover is death and destruction and, and um, it does kind of um, force us to rethink what is the role, not just of solutions journalism in the kind of uh, happy story um, model that is sometimes right. portrayed, but just in, in, in presenting a fuller picture of the realities um, in many of these places. Yeah. But I, if I may, I think one thing to, to think about is also who is this journalism for? Who's the intended yeah. recipient? And, and lots of times um, uh, it's about presenting or packaging uh, societies like Global South for the consumption of audiences um, uh, in the West. And I know whether you're talking about humanitarian journalism or even just foreign reporting, that's pretty much how it has developed. Uh, and I think starting to think of the people you report on as themselves an audience, I think would start shifting how you decide is material, what is important. Um, and I think in this age, especially in the I think for um, to, to distinguish between uh, 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 audiences to say that um, what all we are doing this for the West. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, with the New York Times coverage of uh, a terror attack in Kenya about uh, 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 was it last year? I think um, at the beginning of last year, and they had used a picture that you know was, showed a few dead bodies, um, and there are very very few Kenyans who actually read the New York Times. You know, but enough Kenyans who are um, offended by this caused the stink that forced the New York Times to respond. You know, so it's not just about the people who pay for your newspaper. You know, it's to think about how everybody else across the world can actually see it, and then to start thinking, how would they um, respond to this? What is my ethical responsibility? to the people who I am reporting about, not just to the audience to whom I am providing this information. And I think that uh, trend that you've just described of not only uh, audiences that are the subject of reporting, sorry, not audiences, as you said, they're often not the audience, but the communities that are the subject of foreign reporting, but also um, junior staff within newsrooms and, and publishers are really starting to have more of a voice in um, and saying, here's our expectations of how the media should behave and uh, demanding more of publishers than I think in the past we've seen. Um, so your, your example from the New York Times is one of them. I think we're in a similar situation where our audience has historically been international policymakers. And so we were writing for them and not necessarily, we were writing about people in the global south for people in the global north. And now we're realizing that that's just not good enough anymore. And, and that means that we are going to have kind of multiple audiences that might have different needs. Um, and that creates a real challenge. And I think one of the things we're now grappling with, um, and it's part of the way in which, you know, these increasing expectations of communities um, is changing the game, is we need to be thinking what stories are of service to these communities rather than what stories are sexy to an international audience. And that's a real shift in mindset, I think. Yeah, well, it, it is. And uh, what, what I would say is it's, it's both ways. So um, for the for your various audiences, what do they need? To, what, 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 what's the goal here? So um, I think when you're hunting, um, you shouldn't ignore the, the, the Western audience up there, you know, um, uh, clearly they need to hear something, um, they need to understand something that you're trying to communicate, but it is how you do it, so it is not um, uh, presenting a caricature in essence um, uh, of a society, but that's, um, the, the media has been pretty bad at doing that. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think, little, been, I think um, you're saying uh, that, that we need to move away from caricaturing societies. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, it's to try and present a full picture. It's actually about to explain about explaining things um, uh, rather than simply reporting. 
you know, um, incidents. And I think one of the things to think about, uh, we might talk about this a bit, uh, a bit more, is uh, how similar situations are, are presented differently depending on where they occur. So if you think about it, for example, for uh, the humanitarian side, what is a humanitarian crisis? It was to ask somebody a situation where 14% um, uh, of your population doesn't have enough to eat. Is that a humanitarian crisis? Now, if it was happening in Congo, it might be recognized as that. But it is a situation in the US, you know, but you'll never hear that being called a humanitarian crisis, you know. So again, it is rethinking the language you use and what are the definitions of that. Um, you had mentioned my Twitter feed at the beginning, um, and part of what I was trying to do was to take this language that is used about other places and to ask, what, I mean, does it really mean um, what's happening uh, uh, in the West? And in many cases, you find and it's actually seen as different. It's seen as um, kind of unique to the global south. They are the only guys who have um, are, are, are dictators and uh, are people who hang on to power, you know, and stuff like that. But you look across the world, I mean, you've got a, a queen who's been in power for 70 years. You know, it, it might be argued if that was happening here, it wouldn't really be presented. Uh, uh, something to be proud of. <laughs> and I, I think the other way in which um, we're now starting to realize our kind of hypocrisies or, or how words are used differently depending on, um, you know, which context. Uh, there was a, a real push from uh, at least um, Canadian and US journalists, uh, although I think it was much broader than that, but a number of open letters um, in in calling out for better media coverage of Palestine, for example, and um, in describing not uh, an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but the kind of deeper um, root causes of the suffering there, which they, they see as settler colonialism. Um, when we talk about, you know, we often have these kinds of uh, words like Haiti is the is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And we throw that into our articles and we don't explain that it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere because it's been subject to um, exploitative practices by the global North for years and decades. So it's those kinds of, I think, also calling out the, um, the underlying causes of the, the, the reasons why there is so much death and destruction in the global south um, that can also be part of decolonizing our journalistic practice, being a bit more honest about the backstory and, and the power dynamics at play. Yeah, I mean, I completely get the, the need for the backstory to explain it, but um, I also really think it's about being conscious that what's happening there is not um, uh, different in a sense from what's happening across the world. I mean, um, if you think about police killings in the uh, 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 in the U.S., you know, that is racist violence perpetrated by the state. You know, um, it's the equivalent of what we call tribal violence. Where, you know, um, uh, it's, it's discrimination based on ethnicity. You know, this and this, you know, um, this sort of idea that those societies are fundamentally different you know, from Western societies, you know, um, they don't subscribe to kind of the similar things that uh, 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 um, uh, people in the West do, you know, um, rule of law, you see. You know, this is not true. And then also they're not just defined by their violence. You know, they are people who are working um, to improve lives. They are heroic stories. Today. And I'm not one of those who say what we need is more positive journalism. I don't I don't think so. Uh, is what we need more, uh, more context, more explanation, so people can understand what it means to live in a society. Uh, um, what does it mean to mean to live in Mogadishu? Not like you're being blown up all the time. You know, there is life happening there. Uh, people going for parties. You know. ETC, but this is never presented. All you hear about are the bombs, and it makes it very hard to imagine those people as to humanize them in the same way 
you think of yeah. your own neighbors as people who also, for example, in the West have to navigate, you know, shootings uh, 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 and stuff like this. I wonder, I mean, it feels like the fundamental or the underlying uh, challenge here is that uh, journalists are by definition gatekeepers. And so we, defi we decide how we label certain situations, which stories we decide to tell, which stories we ignore. Um, and, and you've written, you know, that historically uh, professional news people who are usually white men um, have manned the gates to the public sphere and debates over media ethics inevitably skew towards their preferences and their interpretations. And that then becomes institutionalized in professional codes um, adopted by media organizations. How do we get away from that if being a gatekeeper is kind of part and parcel of what it means to be a journalist? Um, is there a way of lifting up towards a kind of different definition of what um, quality journalism might look like that isn't as Western in its philosophy? And is there such a thing as a universal kind of um, code uh, that, what would that, what would that even look like? Well, I mean, you, you put your finger on it. I think that that is one of the big unanswered questions about where media is going. So um, if you think about how the model we have today developed, um, uh, lots of it developed in the West. And then, um, as you say, it was journalists. Basically, they were in charge of the public sphere. They were the gatekeepers. They're the ones who decided which were the voices that were privileged to speak. Um, Things have changed um, quite a bit now, especially with the internet age. You've got many more uh, people with access uh, uh, to, to, to the public sphere. So that poses questions, I think, for the media. You know, what role now do we play? Um, and I think the, the, there are two ways to think about this, that um, in terms of the changing um, ethics that we have, so they both say that Basically, we will have a system where um, we all agree on what does uh, a universal media ethics look like. You know, what universal professional media ethics look like, and then uh, we will basically integrate towards one, and we'll all agree. But there are others who say that this is not possible. That basically, what you will have is many, you know, of of, of journalism. And that um, uh, basically will always have a fragmented sphere. I tend to think that you will probably have a little bit of both, that you will have people who will be trying to uh, uh, have a, a professional code that is universal, that applies across all, but you will always have this um, uh, uh, different strands of journalism. And what we should really be doing is questioning the format that we have now, whether it breaks down into a fragment or it becomes uh, or is improved into a more uh, a universal system, for me, is not in itself uh, problematic. You know, the problem we have is the, what what we currently have. You know, and moving away from it and to, to see what else is possible. And we'd rather try out a few more things and, 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 and see where we go with it, rather than be stuck with what's uh, what's there, which is what is causing all of these issues, all of these problems. Um, uh, it is underlying it are the assumptions that we uh, I talked about at the beginning that we need to get rid of. That is the work of decolonization, is to get rid of these assumptions that we have assumed have to underlie how we report. And to be quite honest, um, uh, once we do that, we might have a messy period where we're trying to figure things out, but that is important to have. That's important to go through because what we'll end up with at the uh, uh, we'll come out with at the end of it is a media that is more relevant, not just to a small um, section of, of the global population, but to everybody across it. the way in which um, stories are framed, the, the language that is used to describe um, people and communities and developments in the Global South compared to the Global North. We've talked about um, how uh, media ethics are, are Western um, in their nature. 
for people listening to this conversation and wondering kind of okay i'm i'm committed to trying to decolonize um journalistic practice where do i start what are some practical things that um you would recommend people consider uh, i can give a few examples from what we're thinking through um we are looking at uh, a, a mentorship program that can help um, journalists from the Global South um, enter into our newsroom and share their insights and perspectives with us uh, much more regularly. We're thinking about new kinds of formats that would allow people from um, diverse communities around the world to express themselves a bit more authentically than having their stories kind of rewritten by um, Western editors. Um, I'd love to just hear any, any kind of practical thoughts you have on the way forward. Well, I think some of this is stuff that can be done fairly clear and within the context of what we already have. So I think of, uh, and we've touched on some of it. So language is one. How do we utilize language? You know, what are the sorts of words that we use for the global south that we don't use elsewhere? You know, um, uh, and, and just have standard ways of speaking that acknowledge the humanity of people in the world. Um, the second thing um, uh, I, I think is to train. We need to have much more emphasis on ethical training for journalists. Um, uh, I think lots of people from the research I've done, um, uh, both in the West and in the in the global south, um, there's not so much deliberative, methodical, ethical um, reasoning about how you present that you present things. You understand what are the potential um, dangers that you have. Lots of people will look towards peers, you know, um, who will simply really be reflecting back their biases. You know, so it's it's really important to get journalists to start thinking about where their blind spots might be and how they might go about um, uh, uh, tackling that, you know. Um, and I think the third thing is to start recognizing the need, you know, um, uh, uh, for decolonization, for changing the the way uh, uh, media has been practiced. Um, I think having that and having the sorts of conversations um, you guys want to curate and you guys want to push, I think would be really important in helping a new way of doing journalism, not just emerge, but also spread out across the globe so that people can see that um, uh, the format that we're used to is not simply the only way of doing it. There are many more ways that we can uh, report on, 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 on issues across the globe. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I, and I think that we are um, indeed in the process of trying to build a, a new model for journalism. And that's a really daunting um, but necessary uh, and exciting task. And I am um, proud to be uh, on that journey and would invite others to join us. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will be um, convening a, a number of media organizations to delve into this more deeply and really exchange ideas and lessons on um, what this looks like in practice and a, a concrete way forward. So if you are interested, um, sign up, uh, I'll, we'll drop a, a link in the chat where you can leave your email and get informed uh, about that. Um, for more on our work, you can check out the newhumanitarian.org and theelephant.info. And I thank you all for um, your interest and, and uh, apologize for the internet challenges in the age of remote work. And thank you.